What's up, everyone? Welcome to the Rudest Wrestling Podcast, episode number four. Uh, Matt, we have so many things to talk about. I don't know that how we're going to do it all this week. Uh, what's going on down there in Ohio? We'll just get, get ready to uh, get right into the college and high school season, so getting prepared for that. Um, but a be- better question is, what's new with you? <laughs> That's the question. Well, um, I've been roasting people on Twitter like it's my job, and, and it kind of is. Uh, but, you know, the bigger news is that um, it was announced that I was traded to the, the UFC. Uh, that happened. That formal announcement was made, I think it was Saturday, Friday or Saturday. No, it was made, I think it was Thursday. And then the, the, all the paperwork actually got done on Saturday. So that's, you know, an exciting new wrinkle in my career. I kind of knew it was coming for a few weeks here. I just had to um, – I had to keep it a secret. I, could, I couldn't tell anybody. Yeah, yeah. So walk us through that that timeline a little bit, and how you know how did yeah. all of this get introduced to you? What were the developments of it? Yeah, here, here's the deal. I, I re, when I retired, I meant it. I I really meant it. I and uh, I said I was retired unless I got the opportunity to fight the best guys in the world to prove I was the best. That's that, you know, uh, Chael always says it's not how much money you make, it's how much money you keep. And I was able to. Uh, be fairly frugal with the money I did make for my other fighting. And, you know, I'm doing pretty well in, in, in life to the point where I don't need to fight for a living. And so when I retired, I said, I'm retiring unless I can fight the best guys in the world. Um, and at that point, I still had a little bit of time left on my one championship contract. And, uh, you know, they, they knew what I wanted to do. So, but, you know, the, the way they work is they said, let's let's create a win-win situation, which, I, you know, I love. And that that's kind of the way they work. And so, you know, there was a few of the talks about possibly doing a uh, co-promotion with Bellator when, I, you know, Rory McDonald and I got into it. Um, and then uh, so, sometime last month, they said, well, what if we traded you? And I said, and I, I said, well, sure. Can, can, oh, can we do that? Is that, is that allowed? Because that's never happened before. Never right? happened. This is the first. And, and, uh, and, you know, I kind of thought like, oh, yeah, this, this isn't going to work. There's no way anyone's going to go. This is ridiculous, you know? Even me, I thought this was ridiculous. And they called me, I, th- I think it was about 10 days later, and they said, hey, you've been traded for Demetrius Johnson. And I'm like, what? Are you, are you kidding me? That's, how, how does this even work? And they, So was, know, this, was this just straight up contract for contract? They just that's, swapped that's, you guys yeah, over, I mean, basically? I, honestly, I've been, kind of, I've been out of the loop. It's been a, it's been a business-to-business deal. I, I haven't really been involved besides the fact that saying, yes, I'm okay if you do that, and that's, yeah, that's exciting. Um, and so, you know, one championship was able to create a win-win situation. I think every single party got what they wanted. You know, one championship got Demetrius Johnson, UFC got me. I wanted to go fight the, the welterweights who were ranked higher than myself. Um, and Demetrius Johnson wanted to go to one championship. So every, every party won on this. Every party got what they wanted. Which is great. Which and, is, uh, yeah, is great. Yeah. Which is everything that I've read about Demetrius Johnson. Like he's really excited. A lot of people are under the impression like, oh, he's just getting shipped over to this other organization. But it seems like he's, like you said, he's very excited about this new opportunity for him and it it provides maybe a better platform for him. Yeah. You know, that's what he thinks. And obviously I, you know, I'm, I'm a a trash talking son of a gun. And so, you know, they, they really didn't take to that very well in Asia. I had to be very, um, I don't know what the right term would be. You know, I had to pull myself back from what who I, you know, what I really wanted to be, what what character I really wanted to portray. I kind of had to pull it back a little bit, um, which you know, what wasn't necessarily ideal for me because I think one of the one of the gifts I have or one of the values I bring to fighting is that um, I'm I'm el- I'm fairly eloquent as far as fighters are concerned. You know, I'm not maybe I'm not a poet or anything, but. Uh, a lot of these fighters are dum dums, and all they want to say is, "I'm tough. I fight. I want to punch him in the face." You know, they they can't really uh, elaborate on anything else. And so you're, you're gonna you're gonna need an aspirin after I I get done with yeah. you. I'm gonna I'm gonna knock the curls out of your hair. Those, so, those, those exactly. That love, yeah, that love, it's a very low level of banter. And so you know, Demetrius never talked, and he never liked to talk. And you know, obviously, uh, as far as UFC is concerned, you know, Demetrius's pay per views were never huge sellers, and that was probably a huge reason why. And you know, if you watch uh, any of the one championship promotion, they don't, they literally won't promote people talking trash on each other. And, Interesting. Uh, yeah, and so you know, their thing is about honor. It's about martial arts. You know, martial arts has been in Asia for the last. 3,000, 5,000 years. 
And so, you know, that's kind of perfect for Demetrius because that's 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 who he is, right? That's what he wants to be. And so I, you know, and then obviously they they already have a pretty good roster of small, you know, Asia. If you look at even wrestling into Asia and whether it's Japan or, or wherever, they have good lower weights, right? But they're not a lot of good upper weights. Um, and so, you know, one championship is kind of the same thing. They they have a pretty steady roster of good guys who are smaller. And so Demetrius is going to have a bunch of good fun fights right right off the bat over there uh, in one championship. Good. Good for him. Yeah. Yeah. So I I think obviously we do a, re- a wrestling podcast. We yep. want to talk about wrestling. We want to educate the wrestling base on different aspects and, and, uh, different, different areas in the, in the sport of wrestling. But I think it's really important. I mean, you're, you're one of the biggest wrestling figures. Yeah. You know, in our sports, you're, you're one of the best wrestling minds in our sport and you've got this new platform to actually educate the world about wrestling in a more eloquent and intelligent way. Yeah. Um, so let's take a step back for, for, for the strict wrestling enthusiast who doesn't <laughs> really is not really familiar with the world of MMA kind of let's, let's take a, a backtrack a little bit and talk about your history in the sport of MMA. Oh, okay. Well, f- fair, fair enough. Um, I would like, Matt, I want to get to the world championships because there's a lot of fun stuff today, but we'll, we'll, we'll hit this sure. for sure. So, um, so for me, I mean, I watched MMA as a kid, right? MMA came around in 1993 and I think my dad brought home the VHS mm-hmm. tapes or whatever. Um, but then, you know, when I was in college, obviously there's kind of a dark age of MMA, right? So 93 to say 2003, four, um, it was really struggling. It was fledgling. They weren't making a lot of money. And really, you know, really they say the turning point was the one that was the ultimate fighter on spike is where it really started cranking up in, in America. Um, and so obviously at that point, what I saw was a whole bunch of fellow wrestlers going to have success, which is, which that from 2004 to 2018, that's been true, right? Wrestlers have the most success at M- MMA. And I always say, very, very few people say this line, Matt, but I say it proudly. Folk style wrestling is the best martial art on planet Earth. There's no doubt about that. We've set up uh, an octagon or a cage all around the world. People have competed in the sport for the last, you know, really heavily for the last 15 years. There's no one more dominant than wrestlers. We're, we are the, literally the best fighters on planet Earth. Um, and that's something I say probably, which a lot of other people don't say. And so I saw a lot of other people who I knew, whether I was teammates with or I competed against or I was friends with, have start having a lot of success in mixed martial arts. So obviously my wheels started turning. I love combat. I love individual sports. I love challenging myself. And so when I graduated from college, 2007, it was, you know, I had some decent offers, but I said, hey, I'm going to, you know, I, well, my, my main goal since I've been young is, the younger kid is to go to the Olympics. So I'm going to do that. After I was done with the Olympics, I said, okay, now, now is my chance to really go try this. If I hate it, if I don't like it, if I'm not making enough money, um, I can always go back and try to wrestle for the next Olympics. But I went and I, and I tried it. I really enjoyed it. Um, and, uh, I had success and I started making money. And so then, you know, I, I never really went back to, I did wrestle a few matches here and there. I, I never really went back to wrestling, right? I was fighting the whole time and I, you know, I, I won a title on belt or I held it. I won, I won the belt and won championship and I held it. And so, you know, I'm 18 and 0. I've been undefeated for the last nine years. Um, I've held belts in, in two of the three major organizations for, I want to say probably combined se- seven years of those nine years, right? It, it's a really, really freaking long time. Um, and so now the last thing on my checklist is to go beat some of these guys who are more highly ranked than myself. And throughout, I mean, you've fought some high level guys. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, but you've been relatively untested and unscathed in every one of your fights. I don't think you've ever really been tested. Have you? Well, well, the, the one tough fight I had, um, it was Jay Haran. It was a guy he, you know, he actually wrestled at the divisional level at Hofstra, um, and he, he's a really tough dude. And he, I think he was like 22 and four when I fought him. And I think I was set, either seven and zero or eight. No. So it was either my eighth fight or my ninth fight. Um, I had just moved to Milwaukee and that was when I moved to Milwaukee was when I started actually full-time training, you know? So I was, uh, I was for a long time either coaching at Missouri or Arizona state and competing in mixed martial arts. So I wasn't, I wasn't putting my full effort forth towards mixed martial arts. I was kind of doing it on the side. And then, um, I, you know, I won the Bellator belt. I was starting to get paid well. And I said, Hey, um, I should probably do this full time, at least for a while. 
And so I moved back to Milwaukee because there's a, there's a good camp called Rufus Sport. And so that was my first fight when I was here um, at Rufus. And, you know, he had good wrestling background. I, I won the fight, I think, 49, 46, and 48, 47, something like that. But that was, that was definitely my most challenging fight, and that was in 2011, yes. And so since 2011, it's, it's been steamrolling. I haven't really had uh, too much of uh, competition. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. So, I mean, for those people that are a little bit more informed in the world of MMA, it seems like for the longest time, I don't know, six, six plus years, maybe you've been knocking on UFC's door. You've been knocking, knocking on Dana White's door. You've been trying to hound him down to try yeah. and get this done. What, was, what, why hasn't this happened before? Well, now? I, well, so really I only had one period, right? The period of, of my free agency was, you know, that was really, so in 2013, I finished my Bellator contract, uh, I believe July 31st was my last fight. Um, and, and the negotiations went, negotiations went south. And frankly, I don't know. I have some good guesses on why they went south, but I, I genuinely, I don't know. Um, and so, that, hey, I'm probably going to ask him now. So I'm, I'm probably going to get some answers to my questions, which is fantastic. Um, so at that point, uh, when negotiations went south, I ended up signing with one championship in Asia. Um, I started fighting for them in 2014. I won the belt in 2014. And so I, I've been under contract with them. So I haven't had another negotiation period, right? But um, obviously, all the fans who recognize my skill, every single time I win, win another fight, they say, God, we need to see Ben Askren in the UFC. And so I, other people have been talking about that, although it has not been myself. And I, you know, uh, you know one of the things that Dana White said a lot when I, when I did not sign with one was that I needed more experience, you know, which was, which was laughable at the time. And it, it still is. And so, you know, I would kind of always joke or, you know, people saw it as being bitter on Twitter. It wasn't me being Twitter. It was me kind of just like prodding and, and being funny. Um, you know, when they, when they had someone who was, you know, they signed CM Punk when he was zero and zero. And yet Dana's, Dana's answer was I needed more experience. So when stuff like that happened, that was laughable. Um, or, you know, a lot of people said, oh, Bellator fighters suck. And so when a Bellator fighter, El Eddie Alvarez, goes and wins a belt in, in UFC, um, I kind of mess with everyone on that thing. So, no, you know, there has there was really only the one negotiation period. And then, and then after that, it was just uh, other people talking, but not, nothing for myself. So, yeah. So at one point, I thought there was a deal in place, right? Was there was there a deal in place for you to go to no, the UFC? Never. No, never. No, never. Okay. Never was. Nope. There, there okay. never was a, any type of deal for, for me to go there. Um, there was the, the one time we sat down and talked in 2013 and that did not go so well. Um, and that, and that was it. So do you think it has to do with your, I don't know. I don't want to speculate. Personality? I don't, I don't no. want to, I don't want to speculate what's in his brain. Um, Especially now, the fact that I'm under contract, I'm gonna I'm gonna stay away from speculating what's inside his brain. And maybe at some point, uh, Dana will tell me what he was thinking at that point in time. Yeah. So you finally got what you want. You've got the opportunity to fight the best, or who people say, who people say that that that's, that's the, the best good point in the there. world, right? Yeah. Who the, who that you know here here's the misconception in fighting is that mm. um, the UFC has a very deep talent pool, right? But so a lot of people confuse that as a deep talent pool, meaning they're the best bar none. OK, and what we've seen and people don't pay attention to history, but what we've seen with these other organizations, whether it was with Strike Force or, or um, WEC or Bellator is when these guys come over, people generally think of them as second rate. You know, the, a great example would be the lightweight division in WEC. People said, oh, they're good, but they're just they're just good for WEC. And then. Out of that crop, Ben Harrison won a belt. Anthony Pettis won a belt, and so you know, two of those guys um, who were champions, you know, champs or highly ranked in WC came over one UFC belt. And so while I while I would concede that the UFC has better depth than other organizations, the fact that they have all the best fighters in the world, that their fighters are significantly better than everybody else's, I, I don't know that that's true. I think there's, there's you know, whether it's one championship or Bellator or in the past, WC or Strike Force, um, I think all of those organizations have guys who are or can be the best in the world at their weight class. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. So, I mean, the one thing that, that, that I've been thinking of is like, how truly deep, though, is the talent level in the sport of MMA? You know, I know we've talked about, we've seen a lot of crossover, a lot of wrestlers 
having a high level of success. But really in the world of wrestling, I mean, you are one of the elite talents out there yeah. um, that, that has made an Olympic team, won multiple NCAA titles, won Hodge trophies. You're one of the most decorated wrestlers uh, to come into the sport of MMA, but there's not a high level depth of talent that's well really in there. I mean, yeah, okay, so I, you know, I, I, see, I see, yeah, I see what you're getting at, and obviously, you know, high any high level wrestler that does crossover has ends up having quite a bit of success. You know, uh, the other two members of the 2008 Olympic team who who decided to fight are both you know, current UFC champions, actually Henry Cejudo and and Daniel Cormier. So both those guys are having high level success. Um, so, you know, yeah, you are, you are correct, right? And, and the difference between, say, MMA and wrestling is that in wrestling, there's a lot of people, a lot of people who start wrestling at age five, who in middle school wrestle almost year-round, who in high school wrestle year-round, who go to a good, good college program with the best guys in the world, and there's these huge p- talents, right? Huge pool of skilled athletes all working together to get better. And so when you have that, you, you know, you have obviously a, high, a lot of high level kids in one place or, and you develop across America a huge amount of high level talent. And then you have the same thing happening in other parts of the world, whether it be Russia uh, or Iran or wherever. And in mixed martial arts, you don't really see people doing mixed martial arts as a five-year-old, nor, nor would I ever recommend it, right? I don't think five-year-olds should do MMA. And so when, when you're getting people who start later, uh, later in life, you know, and like say some people are starting at say 16, 17, 18, which is actually early. But if you look at a lot of wrestlers, the ones who have success, they're not starting until after their college career or, or in Daniel, Daniel and Henry's case, even later than that. Um, and so you do see that, you know, the age being later. And I think generally speaking, um, there aren't as many people who as who are as good at that skill as you would have in wrestling or basketball or football or whatever. No, I, I, I get that. And that's one of the thoughts that I've had as well. Like, I mean, when we see these big pay-per-view cards, you know, on, from the UFC, you know, I'm, I'm interested, like for me, just from a, a strictly a fan perspective, Yeah, I can't wait for you to show these people what your skill level actually is yeah, and how it actually mat- matches up. And I actually think exceeds a lot of the upper echelon talent yeah. that people rank as <laughs> some of the top five in the world or yeah. depending on the weight class. Like, you know, when I see, I've, I've heard pundits talk about, you know, y- your style, your style of fighting isn't that attract attractive to the normal fan. But I'm like, well, when you dominate someone as yeah. completely as you dominate people, it's not that entertaining. Right. And, and that, that has um, a lot to do with this is the fact that it's one sided and, and and frankly, if you know the outcome of something, then it becomes less exciting, right? You think about it. If you uh, if you watch, uh, say, if you watch a wrestling match, um, and you know the result of it, it's not as exciting as if you watch a match and you don't know the result of it, right? And exactly. That, same thing with my fight. When you know the result of it, it's not that exciting. Um, and then so now the other thing uh, that you got going on here is, you know, the fact that I haven't fought anyone that's in the top five that's one thing but who i've trained with over the last nine years i've trained with uh, the who's who of mma right whether it's 155 pounders 170 pounders 185 pounders i've trained with everyone and so uh i know what skill over that how good they are that kind of thing and so although you you as a pundit right not you matt but you the the journalist although they have not seen it happen doesn't mean it hasn't happened right i so i i know where i stand um as far as high level mixed martial arts competition goes yeah, because I've I've seen a lot of people coming out of the woodwork this weekend, and they're talking I, so about to, how excited they. Are. To be fair, I haven't even looked at my Twitter mentions. They've been so insane. I just freaking scroll and scroll and scroll. So I I, I generally know what the idiots are saying on Twitter, but I don't know what the idiots are saying this weekend on Twitter. Yeah, there's plenty of idiots out there, and that's that's you know <laughs> uh, a common trait in the world of MMA, like. Um, uh, but well, when well, I was let's, about, let's like, be fair, man. There's a lot of idiots in every genre of Twitter. This Not is true. MMA. This is true. This is true. But I was talking about the guys that were act, actually speaking intelligently to your level of skill, like Tyron, uh, Tyron, Tyron Woodley yeah. and Daniel Cormier and some of the guys in the wrestling world that you've probably sparred with and trained with. Yeah. They're like, you guys have no idea. 
how good this guy is. So it's yeah. not, it's, it's not that you haven't fought the best talent out there. You haven't had the opportunity to fight these I guys, right? I haven't had the opportunity. That, that's, the, that's the key word there, yeah. So, yeah. yeah, so I'll be getting the opportunity. You know what? Uh, to kind of wrap this up, I, I I am headed to New York this week. I'm, I'm going to meet with um, the UFC brass and kind of, um, you know, I actually have to renegotiate my contract, and then we got to talk about who I'm going to fight and when I'm going to fight and and all all of that stuff. So, you know, honestly, it's a, it's kind of a big life switch for me because I did, I you know, I was hoping something like this would happen, but I wasn't holding my breath, right? I, I got on with my life. I was, I, you know, doing other stuff um, to try to move my life forward. And then now that this happened, now I got to kind of revert and make some switches. So I, I got some big changes coming in my life. It's fun. It's exciting. Um, and hopefully, you know, within uh, a couple weeks, uh, I will know even more than I do today. Okay. So I know a lot of these things aren't in your control, but yeah. if you could control them, who would you want to fight? Well, it's, that's the thing. It's, it's not worth talking about because obviously my number one and two would be GSP and Khabib, and I know there's no way in hell I'm getting either one of those two first round. Uh, and so, you know, I think I, I'm hoping to get matched up with this Englishman named Darren Till. He just fought for the world title. He, he's ranked number two. Um, I had a Twitter a little Twitter fight with him. I don't, I don't, I think he's over, significantly overrated. So I, I would like to fight him. I'm willing to go to London to fight him. Uh, and, and so we will see. What happens uh, with that? So ideally, what what weight will you fight at? I'm going to fight at 170. You know, I, okay. and, and I'm going to make a push for the 165 and 175 split, which has has been heavily discussed by a, both a lot of fighters um, and, and the UFC in, in general. So that there is a, a thought of going to those two weight classes. So you know, uh, if that happens, I could fight either 165 or 175. Obviously. My wrestling weight for the Olympics was 163 pounds. And, um, you know, it would take some work to get back there, but I, but I definitely could. So you think you can make that comfortably and function? Well, I mean, it's it's a day well, before weigh-in, day right? Before, it's, exactly. It's day before weigh-in. So, and it's even more than wrestling, right? Because day before weigh-in and wrestling means you're, um, say, weighing in. When it was that, you were weighing in at, say, 3 o'clock, and then you were wrestling the next morning at 9 a.m. And, and in wrestling... Um, I'm sorry, in fighting, you weigh in at, say, 4 o'clock, right? Uh, well, no, I'm sorry, they do morning ones now. So, you, okay, so you weigh in at 9 a.m., and then you don't fight till like, 9 p.m. the next day. So it's almost a it's almost a 36-hour period uh, or gap between when you fight and um, – I'm sorry, when you weigh in and when you fight. Yeah, I mean, this is probably another topic for another time, but the act, the science behind rehydration – to me is fascinating yeah, because some sure. people are like you just drink up and you're, you know, you, you, you eat and drink back up and it's as simple as that. But there is actually a science behind rehydration and being fully prepared and get your, getting your muscles recovered um, and your brain, because that's yeah. the other thing that people yeah. don't understand too. Like when you're sucking this amount of water and these fluids out of your body and you're shrinking literally 15% of your, your body weight, in a relatively short period of time, what yeah. that does to your brain and what what your brain is susceptible to if you're not recovered properly, like you you can get some serious damage done to yourself. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that, so I guess this is going to be a fluid conversation. Um, excited for everything yep. that's coming coming ahead for you. Excited that you actually are going to be able to show the world that you are the best MMA fighter in the world. Absolutely. And uh, we, we can't, we can't wait to share that journey with you. Absolutely. So let's talk about, let's, let's finish up our world's discussion. Cause you know, we had the two episodes last week where we talked about it. So we, we need to talk um, about both the, the women and Greco. Um, I, I'd like to start with Adeline Gray. Cause obviously she was our bright point. So in women's wrestling, we, we got four medals Adeline Gray was our – she was our gold medalist. I watched her matches. I, I thought she looked good. Um, and so for those of you who don't know her story, she won world titles in 13, 14, 15. She failed to place at the Olympics in 2016. She took last year off, and then she came back this year and, and won her fourth world title. So um, I thought becoming, she looked, Becoming – let's, let's – uh, What, the third person her, to win? Give her her due. She's she was the fourth person to fourth. win four world titles. Fourth right? person in American history to win four world titles. So yeah, who who are they? They're Smith, Burroughs. Who's the last one? 
Mark Schultz. Smith Burroughs. Mark Schultz, maybe? No. Mark was Mark or was Dave. three. Dave Dave was actually two. He was Dave was one gold. Olympics. One Olympic, one one Olympic, one world title. Oh God! So, so it was John. It was. Are you sure she's not the third? She might just be the third. I, yeah. I think it's the third. Which incredible achievement! She's probably got the most lethal game over. If she gets on top, game over, match over. Yep. She's got one of the most lethal leg laces in the world, and that was kind of. She made it look almost pedestrian at this point because yep. she got on top and ended the matches quickly. So incredible achievement for her, history making achievement for her, obviously becoming no, the the other person was um Trisha Saunders, right? Oh yeah, I believe so. I, I believe it was Trisha Saunders. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So the fourth fourth wrestler in American history to win four world titles. So amazing accomplishment uh, accomplishment by Adeline Gray. Um, and she's still got years, years to yeah, go. She's still, I, mean, I, she's I believe still, she's only 20. I can look it up right now, man. I'll look it up. I, I think she's only, uh, 26 years old. Uh, here we go. She's 27 right now. So, you know, yeah. she, she won her first world title. Um, uh, oh, it's 2012. So I misspoke. It was 2012 when she won her first world title. Um, she was only 21 years old when she won her first world title. Um, and then she also has the bronze in 11 and 13. So, um, definitely. So 20, so 2020 is definitely in her wheelhouse. 2024 Absolutely. is still a possibility. As I well. don't, I hate, I, even with even men or women, I hate broad, I hate thinking that far down the road to 2024. That to me, that seems like such a long ways away. So, uh, I'm going to stay away from commenting on that. No, I agree with that. And there's so many variables that can be introduced. I mean, look at Helen. I mean, I, I know we got to, talk about Helen, Helen, you know, with, you know, her journey back from her head trauma and her brain injury, um, stuff like that can happen. So you never know what you you never know, but I'm just talking about straight age. You would think she's got years, years to go and and absolutely things she can still achieve. So, yeah, let's get into, um, Hell, so Helen, you know, I guess you mentioned it there and not a lot of people. I don't know that, you know, it was a super public story. They were kind of keeping it hush hush, but obviously had some uh, concussion issues. And that was kind of why her wrestle back got pushed back so far. Um, right. They just had an October, what was it, October 6th, maybe, I think. And yes. right for who's number one. Um, you know, she obviously made the team. But then in her first match, I, I, I don't want to be too critical, obviously, because of what she went through. But you know, just didn't, to me, didn't look like the same Helen that won the Olympic title. Looked a little gun shy. Yeah. For obvious reasons, right? I mean, uh, in her post-match inter- interview, she even discussed, like, she she didn't, her and her coaches didn't allow anybody to club her or hand fight hard with her or attack her head just because of the nature of the, the, the brain injury and the post-concussion syndrome. So even in her training, she wasn't fully engaged in full hand-to-hand combat and um, wrestling yeah. live. It yeah. sounded like she was basically like, you know, wrestling, you know, positional wrestling, situational wrestling, high-level intense, um, high-level drilling, those type of situations. So that's that's hard. I mean, when you're when yeah. you're talking about wrestling on the, the, the biggest stage and wrestling for a world title, if you haven't actually been able to go live without yeah, any, absolutely. you know, with, without any restrictions, it's hard to feel, feel like you're at your best and be ready to go. So I think it's natural that she did look a little hesitant. Um, and this is just from the outside looking in, she didn't look like her n- normal, natural, aggressive self. Just, um, I don't know what any observations that, that you could share. But that that's no, just from the outside looking in. That's and I'm I'm on the outside looking in also, and I, I feel the exact same way. Um, yeah. So the other one, you know, the other one we had in the finals was Sarah Hildebrandt. I, you know, and I watched her match, her finals match. Um, she looked good, but the the Japanese girl and I, I struggled with the Japanese names. She was just really good, and obviously, you know, Japan's had the best women's wrestling program for many many years now. Um, I mean, they're they're just they're on a different level. They really are. Yeah, absolutely. As, as a country, as a women's team, they're just, it seems like every one of their women are just, 
they're just a step ahead. And I don't know why that it really, is. It really does look like that. Yeah. And I, and I have no idea what they're doing either or why it looks like that. So, but, but she, I thought she looked great. But besides that match, I thought she looked really good. Um, and then we had Tamara Mensa place third. Uh, and Matt, who is our last bronze medal? I can look it up real fast. Velky? Yes. Um, Mal- Mallory Velty. Mallory Velty. And- Velty. Velty. And she yes. was pretty solid throughout the whole tournament. So, you know, I think this team's really young. And the, the other thing is I th- I do think, and I, I just feel it, and obviously I'm around the youth wrestling all the time, I think the support and the participation in women's wrestling is surging. Pro- honestly, probably because in a big part of what because of what Adeline and Helen have done. Um, and so, you know, I think we're going to continue to see bigger norm- numbers of women wrestling. And, w- and when that happens, obviously, we, you know, hopefully we can go and challenge um, a country like Japan. No, for sure. And I think it's only a matter of time before the NCA actually sanctions women, women's wrestling as a Division One sport. I think it's long overdue. I think the numbers justify it being yes. a, a sanctioned D- D1 sport. And I think once you open up the floodgates of, of that, you're going to see the continued growth and expansion of, of college programs around the country. Um, I, I, you know, I look down South in Kentucky, um, to one of my good friends, he's the head coach of, uh, Campbellsville and what That'd they're nice. producing and the, the, the level of talent. Um, his, his daughter, Kayla miracles actually oh, one yeah. of the emerging, I, I'm, emerging young wrestling talents. I mean, she's not emerging. She's been there for, for several years now, but I think he, we were talking the other day and I think just on his team alone, I, I believe he told me he had six national team members nice. on yeah. the women's team in yeah. one women's college program. So as the growth and opportunities of the women's college programs grow, as parity gets dispersed um, throughout the country. And I think, more even the dedicated um, early early childhood development in wrestling, I think you're going to see us really jump to a completely different level over the next decade. But I think you've got to obviously applaud Terry Steiner and the job he's done yeah, for absolutely. what about a, a decade now that he's been for, the for head it. of our women's program for, and forever. He's, yes, he's just doing a phenomenal job, and um, yeah. Yeah, that's uh, off to them. I so I totally agree, and obviously we just had our first women's wrestling program at the collegiate level added in Wisconsin, and so hopefully that that trend will continue. Because I agree, I think it's gonna it's gonna grow. Okay, so New, that, Jer- New, New Jersey just sanctioned uh, women's school. wrestling at the high school at the high school level, so that's exciting to see. So yeah, absolutely. So I think I think also um, uh, Wisconsin, you know, has a huge women's contingent. Obviously, with Macy Kilty, who competed at the Junior and uh, Cadet Worlds, um, Jaden Laurent, who was in the Junior World. So we have a, good, but we still haven't added high school women's wrestling. So I think that you know Wisconsin is going to fall within maybe a year or two, also, and hopefully that'll lead to the dominoes falling and and more and more and more uh, high school states sanctioning women's wrestling. So let, yes. let, let's get into let's get into uh, Greco. It was rough. Um, I think we get. I think we have to discuss the Jesse Thilke interview that we we both watched. And um, ooh, that was rough. I don't. I don't even. I don't even know where to go with that. So um, besides, think, uh, let's talk. You want to talk about Adam Kuhn? That was the one bright spot. You want to talk about him first, or you want to talk about him after we talk about the bad stuff? Let's talk. Let's talk about the good. That's. Okay. I mean, our first. Greco medal since 2015. Is that and, what it was? Yep. And first finalist since 2009. And uh, obviously utterly dominant has four pins in his first four matches. Um, and man, it's crazy to think of how fast he's gotten better, right? Because we knew Adam Kuhn has been good for a while. Obviously improved at the collegiate level this year, getting the win over Kyle Snyder. And then, you know, beating a guy, and I, and I believe, do believe he pinned him in the second match, that he, he's never beaten before. He never beat Robbie Smith before, and he beats him twice, including pinning him once, um, and then goes to the senior-level world and pins his first four opponents before. Um, you know, he kind of got hammered a little bit in the finals, but, um, man, sure, he sure looked good before that. No, he was just he was just blowing through people. I mean, he was a man amongst boys before, before the finals. Um, so, yeah, I mean – like you said, just just from the get go of actually making making the world team, Robbie Smith has had a stranglehold 
on the heavyweight weight class in, in the, for a long time. What two two quads has it been? Yeah, I, I believe so. And, yeah. uh, for Adam to just make the team over a, a seasoned veteran um, and to enter his first senior world championship, it seems like a consistent threat uh, trend, right? Especially on the freestyle side, guys that enter their first world championships and make the podium their first time out. Um, it was exciting to see Adam carry that trend over into Greco, his first senior level world championships, making it to the finals, winning uh, uh, a silver medal, running into a tough Russian who I think actually I beat him, him several yeah. years back in the junior world semifinals early on in his co college career. But it'll be interesting to see. Do you think, what would your, what, what are your thoughts? Should, should, Kuhn just focused solely on 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 Greco yeah, because he I, made, I, he made the finals against Gwizdowski. So I mean he's he's got skills on both sides of the both both sides of the game right there. Yeah, a absolutely. I you know I would go, and obviously I'm not telling Adam Kuhn what to do, but I think it's gonna be tough for him him to focus on both. I think, you know, obviously heavyweight is the one uh, place where where you could do both. You know, besides. That I think Sam Hazel was probably the only person to be competitive in both freestyle and Greco in the last as long as long as I can remember. It's it's been quite a while, um, and so you know when you when you look at that, I think uh, Adam could focus on Greco. I th but then then I think you got to go to you know who the heck's he going to train with, right? I mean he's an enormous human being. It's not like he's a, in a middleweight where he could you know bring a couple guys to Michigan that are just above him or just below him. Adam Kuhn is freaking enormous. So, you know, I don't maybe maybe the Michigan Training Center, maybe the, I think it's called called the Cliff Keen Regional Training Center, maybe they bring in um some foreigners, a couple other heavyweights from other countries who can give Adam a go. Um maybe they bring in a Greco coach. I, you know, I don't know how that's going to go down. Obviously, if we you know, we reference the Filky interview, um the rest of Greco team only won two matches and Filky was very critical of the, of the training situation. And, you know, obviously Filky's truth is, is one side of the truth. Right. And, and I'm sure uh, Matt Lillum, coach Matt Lillum would have a different version of the truth, but then you also have to go back to the results. Matt, the team went besides, if you take Adam Kuhn out of the picture, there's nine weight classes. They won two matches. A any way you slice it, that that's hard to explain. That's really, really hard to explain. It, it, it's kind of unacceptable. Yeah. And you've got, I mean, obviously Matt Lindlin is our Greco national team coach. Obviously what, what people probably fail to realize, like they lay out their training plan a year in advance. So it's not like they were like, I know the, uh, Thiekel Filky. said, well, Thiekel, yeah. Said, Filky. Filky. Come on, Matt, get either Wisconsin boy. You got to get his name right. I'm sorry about that. Filky. But, Filky. There we I got go. it. Perfect. Filky. Hey, Hey, you know what people, Hey man, uh, I had three people this weekend walk by me and go chorizo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we ate. We know people are listening because they called out the chorizo comment, right? Yeah, it's good. Good to know. But what I was saying, I, th I you know that Matt Lindland and the rest of the National Greco staff had a very well laid out plan of action for this coming year and how they were going to prepare leading up to the world championships. Now, can Dilke had his thoughts about being in Europe three weeks leading up to the world championships, which as again, as an outsider, that seems excessive. Especially as, when as, you're, an, as an athlete, I would say I would hate that. I mean, yes. I, you know what? I had to go to Asia for, you know, I would generally go, uh, say, 10 days ahead of my fights. And it's just, it's not the same, right? It's not the same training environment. Um, and yeah, so and obviously, obviously, when you're, when you're getting ready to travel overseas and compete, there's an accl acclimation period that you have to go through. Typically, like you said, you're over there seven to 10 now, days. I don't think, I never felt like that, man. I went to the other side of the world, competed all the time. I felt like, give me two days, I'm good to go. Okay, and, and you know, I know people say longer. I heard someone say one day per hour time change. I think for me, for me, that's not that's not true at all. I had a twelve hour time change in Singapore. It's literally, literally on the other side of the world. Every time I went to Asia, and like I said, I, I felt like two days, maybe three tops, um, and and I was feeling fine. And so, um, you know, but that, for a lot of people, I 25 mean, twenty five days that, that's, that's freaking forever. That's a lot. And but Silky's a single young man, and so 
you know, he's probably he, he's probably bitching about it, but like I can't imagine I can't ima- I can't imagine being away from my family for 25 days. I, I would freaking hate that. And I know obviously like someone like Sam Hazelwinkle and I think some of the other guys have families. Damn. Yeah, I mean hard. you're I mean if you're talking about Sammy, Sammy's 35 years old, he's got a couple kids. Um so that's a big disruptor. I mean, a Huge. big life disrupt every everything is turned upside down. And add on top of that, you know, there was there's the discussion that they were actually training with their international competitors that, that's for several, interesting. several of the weeks. Yeah. Which usually now, I, 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 I wouldn't usually mind that that much, but it does seem very interesting leading up to the competition. Like if we're talking, say, six months before in the winter, kind of whatever. For for me, I would say whatever. But leading up to the competition, that that seems kind of uh, an interesting thought process. Yeah, and I'm sure, like I said, I'm sure Matt Lindland had his reasons. I'm sure if we called Lindland up right now, he could give you every rhyme or reason and every scenario that they played out in their mind, why they constructed the training program. Obviously it didn't go to plan. It didn't go to plan. So everybody's going to be piling on, right? How how many years, how many years has Matt Lillian been the, um, the head grade, is it three years now or four years? I thought it was his fourth. Fourth I could be wrong. Third third or fourth. How how did the Greco team do last year? Do you even remember? I don't, I don't remember. I'm going to look it up. We didn't have anybody medal, right? Uh, I don't know. I'm going to go look it up. I don't, I don't believe we did. Uh, U23 se- seniors. Okay. I'm looking. Um, yeah, I mean, but so, you know, you can, you can explain things really well, but at the end of the day, you know, results are what I remember one of the ADs at Arizona state who I really liked. Um, he had, he, they had, it was right as you walked out the door, they had this little thing on the wall and it said, what it said was your effort is appreciated, but results are what counts. And I thought that was fantastic because um, at the end of the day, if you're not getting results, you're doing something wrong and you need to reevaluate. And if you're too stubborn or if you keep doing what you're doing and, and you can't, um, you know, you can't figure out how to get results, then you don't deserve to be in that position. That That is a position of power. That is a position of privilege. And if you can't get the results, you don't deserve to be there. I would argue there's a lot more challenges facing the Greco-Roman program as opposed to the challenges that the freestyle and the women's program have to overcome. Because I think folk style is much more transitional into freestyle than Greco-Roman is from from folk style into Greco-Roman. It's a completely different sport. And you've got, and the other thing is you've got a lot of these kids that are wrestling Greco-Roman their entire life. Overseas, I I, 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 I totally agree with everything you're saying here. But so I, I actually went back and looked up um, last year's results, and they had exactly zero wrestlers win more than one match. Um, so we're we're but, not, I, but I would I would also argue our talent level isn't but, there. But Matt, we've had we've had we've had success before. You got to remember, in two thousand six, they won the world title in Greco, and obviously, I get that. Well, Greco, the rules change every two years, so we probably shouldn't even bring that up into an argument. But when when you go two years. And you have exactly one guy, Adam Kuhn, win more than one match. Um, man, that's that that's that's tough. That's tough to explain. I, I mean, how else do you explain that? Because people, it's not like no one's ever had success at Greco, right? We have previously had greater success in Greco than we are having right now. No, and I'm not trying to be a, a Greco apologist. I'm just I'm just stating it would, it would be a Matt Little some, apologist. Um, or a Matt Little apologist. I'm just saying there's some real challenges and real obstacles that we have to overcome. And to, to your point, I mean, to, to flip on the other side of the argument, a lot of these guys that have been on the world team, they've been in multiple world championships before. And for them yes. to, 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 to have the same level of results year in and year out, 0-1, oh 1-1, and one, one and one, 0 and 0, whatever, you know, it seems like we – we should be capable of more. And like but, you said, that, that's a coaching thing, right? I mean, if a college program does not have a success, then the coach is getting fired. And I think, you know, same thing here. If, if the, no, you know, but also like this is, this is the thing that people don't understand. These people that they're like, this program needs a change. And when they do make a change, they want immediate results. And it's not that easy. Three years is not a large sample size to say that you can, fundamentally shift and change a program if it's been 
years in decay. If it's been on the decline for 10 plus years and to tell a guy he needs to in, you know, 24 months, turn it around and make this one of the top five teams in the world. That that's not realistic. And I'm not, again, the results aren't there, but I'm, I'm also saying Matt Lindlin hasn't been given a large opportunity. to. Well, actually, I'm trying to find out when he, I'm trying to find out when he was actually hired. Uh, I want to say it was at least four years ago, but I think I think what you're looking for is you're looking for progress. I mean, sure. The I I would venture to say, and I don't follow Greco super closely, so I can't say 100. percent But I would say if you look at the results of the last two World Championships, that's about as bad of a set of results as we've ever had. I, maybe maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm way off. But I feel like when I was whether when I was growing up or when I was at college or senior level, there was always a couple of Greco guys that were either meddling or coming very close to meddling. Obviously, in 06, we talked about they won the world title. Um, yeah, so I, 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 I can't say for sure, but it feels like um, this is kind of at the bottom. Maybe, and, and who knows, maybe I'm way off. Yeah, I guess all I'm saying because I've I've had experience. I've had to I've had to grow programs from the ground up, and to think that it's a snap of the finger and you just make a a change here, change there, and you're going to gain immediate results. I I don't think that's realistic. But you you do have some valid points. I get where you're coming from. Sure. But and I think you know, as Americans, we we believe that we are one of the best, if not the best overall wrestling pro uh, countries in, in the world. When you talk about men's freestyle, women's freestyle, and then Greco, I mean, we were what second overall, as far as medal count goes overall, yeah. we had 12 Greco only contributed one. I, yeah. I get that. Um, so I, I, I see why the wrestling public in general is like, Hey, we're thriving in these two other areas, right? Yeah. We're hitting, on as high a level as we've ever hit in men's freestyle and women's freestyle. And then you see this, this outlier where we're not, we're, we're basically not even competitive. You're like, wait, it's happening in these two other areas. Why isn't it happening in Greco? So I think, you know, you obviously have to have the argument. I've, all I'm saying is I think Greco Roman is faces stiffer, stiffer challenges, stiffer obstacles than men's freestyle in the women's program. That's, that's all I'm saying. Yep. All right, Matt. That's going to be it for this week. Uh, next, uh, our next episode, we're going to cover up the World Championships and uh, and get into the Super Thirty Two. So I'm excited to talk about that. Um, have a great day. All right. Take care, Ben. Peace.